for my first podcast to do wait until there was something significant and over the last couple of weeks something significant did happen indeed um my name is Ginger Lou. Um, I am the founder of Ginger Media and Entertainment. I'm a visual artist and a PhD student researcher, and I'm interested in the afterlife and death and mourning practices uh, from the Victorian era uh, to what exciting things we're going through now, which is in artificial intelligence. But to go back to two things that happened this month of September 2022. First off, well, here's what I think is in the past weeks, two influential women of a similar age died. One was the most famous woman in the world and the other was my aunt. Queen Elizabeth's death at 96 on her 8th of September was followed by 10 days of national mourning in the UK. News channels aired 24-hour coverage of Her Majesty lying in state and a five-mile queue of mourners waiting patiently to pay their respects. This grief was collective and entwined in national pride and personal memories that were signposted by the Queen's 70-year reign. The Queen was omnipresent in people's Lives. She was like a distant relative we hear about and occasionally see at family get-togethers. And although her death has caused collective cultural grief, it is the personal stories about her life that connect our lives to hers, which is why grief surrounding Queen Elizabeth's death has been both collective and personal. As if you're British and part of the Commonwealth. We, we, all, we all get it, we all understand, because we don't remember. Most of us don't remember anything else uh, apart from Queen Elizabeth. That's how long she's been queen. So over the 10 days of national mourning, the media interviewed mourners who lined the mail, and many of them were overcome with grief because of the connection with their own late parents. And for instance, my parents, who are late parents, um, married the same year of the Queen's coronation in 1953. And although my mother wasn't a staunch royalist, um, she couldn't help but watch her on the television and so we watched her on the television growing up and we read newspapers they were everywhere you know memories of the queen ignite memories of our parents and extended family and that's why this collective grief has been personal we all have a story to tell we all you know we all remember certain jubilees or if we've seen the queen or if there's been deaths you know like princess diana and you know it's part of a a collective remembrance that, as I said, is signposted throughout our lives. Um, you know, for instance, you know, the Queen's, I think, Silver Jubilee in the 70s. I do remember that. Um, I don't remember any before that. I'm not that old, thanks very much. But um, I certainly remember... Um, Princess Diana's death uh, because I was living in London at the time and I went to the funeral Um, and I remember listening to people wailing you know so uh, that was a different kind of grief for people than for the Queen because the Queen has been expected to die for quite a few years now though the media have been ready the royal family have been ready and that's why at her funeral on Monday, just gone, um, it was so perfect. It's been, it's been practiced, it's been rehearsed. Um, It was um, faultless, wasn't it? Uh, Very moving, very amazing. And the Queen had input on that too, uh, the music, the bagpipes, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so who's the other person who died? Well, my aunt died peacefully in her sleep on her 99th birthday on the 21st of August. As a resident of Southern California and its long tradition of foregoing religious funerals, my aunt requested that the family, who were dotted around the world, have a gathering in person and via Zoom, where the family could share stories about her incredible and long life. My father's sister 
was a professor of musicology, a trained opera singer and a pianist. She pioneered Chinese language education in California in the 1960s, and her research on China's Kung Kyu opera is held in the Library of Congress. She was our last connection to our late father and the mixed Chinese heritage that she was raised into in China, England and the United States. As a fellow creative, she understood my calling and despite the wide age gap, to quote Justin Trudeau in his statement in the passing of Queen Elizabeth, she was one of my favourite people in the world. Yeah, the gathering of my aunt's passing was organised a few days after her death. The immediate family was present in Southern California and the extended family, which was including me and my brother, uh, from across the United States and the world attended via Zoom video. We watched a 12-minute slide presentation of photographs that mapped my aunt's life from birth to death. Then each of us took it in turn to share stories that reflect on her life. Two days after the gathering, I was emailed the slideshow from my cousin and I inquired about people I didn't recognise in the photographs. Mm-hmm. Family photographs have always been great communicators. In return, I sent a video I had produced of my travels with my aunt in Shanghai. And that was that. Ten days of national public mourning for the monarch and an infinite time to mourn in private for my aunt. The Victorians were masters of public grief. Female mourners were expected to show their grief by wearing black for a an amount of time fitting to their relationship with the deceased. Um, and it was always women. Um, men could return back to their own lives they didn't have to change dress but women do Uh, grief was very much about uh, performance and the women um, performed that grief in public Uh, the dead were put on display in the family's front room so that people could pay their respects and by the end of world war ii the dead were no longer looked after by relatives and it was usual for funeral services to manage preparation and disposal Death, which had been much part of Victorian life, was now hidden from view, and with that, grief was privatised and kept within the confines of the home. The collective familiar grief of the Victorian era was replaced by individual person-centred bereavement that by the end of the 20th century, psychologists could treat and researchers could analyse. So grief has become very internalised. We're, I mean... We're expected to go back to work, you know, our mother dies, our father dies and, you know, we're expected to go go back to work shortly after. Um, We're not um, expected to break down in tears in public. It's all kept very private and, you know, although the family gets together for the funeral, you very often then you're just left to your own devices, you know, and then you've got to try and cope as much as you can. In the 21st century, grieving practices have evolved again to incorporate past cultural practices which were equally driven by technology, society and the human condition. Our grief is still private, but within the confines of our homes where grievers reach out to a collective that is online. So we share messages of experience and comfort with faceless message boards in the digital ether, which is a space to share photographs of our past loved ones when they were alive in a way that Victorians shared post-mortem carte de vis portraits. So we're we're kind of, although it's the digital world and everything is, this grieving is online, this tells you more about the human condition. You know, we're we're not meant to grieve on our own in in the, you know, the four walls of our homes. It's, it's not good, you know, and so psychologists in the, in the mid to late 20th century have kind of taken over the position of the family and, you know, who can afford a psychologist, you know, not everyone can afford, afford that. And um, so, so, so what's, what's kind of replaced the family is the, the digital world. So the internet, uh, where you can reach out to a, a collective online who have similar gr- grievances, you know, who, who can share experiences of a, a lost parent or a lost child. And you know, so it's kind of harking back to the Victorians who had one another, uh, big, large families, of course, uh, wider extended families, and other women to grieve with. Um, and of course, there's Story Fire, which I've written about in a previous post, which I will share with you on another podcast. 
um, which has commercialized technological innovation in artificial intelligence, photography, and video to create a mass market interactive pre-recorded video of the soon-to-be-deceased who can answer questions about their life for future generations. Similarities with the Victorians persist in how we grieve, how we use technology to satisfy and share that grief, and how commercial businesses are taking advantage of a new market of technological innovation that promises the afterlife. So who are the pri providers of grief technology that bridge the gap between the living and the dead? Well, I told you about the similarities. It's Victorian portrait photographers and AI engineers. They both took advantage of an industry in a time and the place. Technical innovation in the Victorian era was photography, taking pictures of our dead loved ones, sh you know, having something to keep uh, that bridged a gap between um, the living and the and the spiritual world or the afterlife. Of course, they had religion too, but. Um, you know, photography was kind of stepping in to religion's hold on on people. And so now, of course, we've got um, AI engineers and commercial companies who also, I don't want to use the, I, well, I have just used it, take, taking advantage of people who are grieving uh, by providing a service that connects you to your dead loved ones, uh, because you are paying for the service, aren't you, after all? Um, so the human condition is in how we grieve and how we do business. Um, I hope you like my first podcast. It's short and sweet, but in the future, uh, I'll be making a few more posts, of course, and but then um, I'll be widening it up to uh, guest speakers from around the world who specialise in all these things that we talked about. And it's going to be an exciting, exciting few years, so I hope... In the future, you will listen. Thank you again. Good night.